Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, idiot, and loin streamer. And today we're doing the book review for Flamer by Mike Corrado. It is a graphic novel. I have a couple articles to actually go with this one. Though this was not on the 2021 list, it was listed on the 2022 list. We're just going out of order now because we're getting down to the wire. And yeah. But before we get started, a couple of things. Number one, if you enjoy what I do here on the channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on the channel, check out the links down in the description below. Number one way to be featured is through LMY, the monthly prompt writing contest, where I give you a prompt, you write a short story or a fragment using that prompt. And on the first Monday video of the month, we read a couple of the prompts and bask in the creativity of the community. The second way to be featured is if you're an indie author and you have a book out, a book coming out, or a bunch of books, submit your first chapter of the book with the cover. They'll be read here on the channel at a random interval, and hopefully that will help more people find your work, because that's what I'm trying to do here. I can't read every book, but hopefully I can help facilitate books finding the people that will love them. Um, and then the third thing is if you would like to check out any of my books, there is, they can be found in the links down below. You can get them at any of your favorite places to get books, including the library upon request, OneDrive, all of that noise. So please enjoy, check them out. Body More 3 coming in October. With that said, let's get into this. Flamer by Mike Corrado was number four on the 2022 list. It was challenged for LGBTQIA plus content claimed to be sexually explicit and the number of challenges were 62. To put that into perspective, there are about 100,000 schools in the United States between public and private K through 12. 62 challenges made the list as number four. I'm just saying. Before we get into this, I want to preface this with the author himself and then some of the controversy around this, all right? So here's an article from KTLA, an interview with Mike Corrado on his controversial LGBTQ young adult novel. Book banners are doing is that they're, they're making people think like my young adult book is being shared in elementary schools. I mean, this is a book for teenagers about teenage life and teenage situations. Um, and it's an honest book. Ah, well, it's interesting that you brought up <clears throat> when Flamer came out because in 2020, there, there was, there were no book challenges to Flamer. Um, it was a very lovely year, year and a half of uh, of really a, a welcoming environment. Um, and then in 2021, a Texas lawmaker uh, shared this McCarthy-esque list of over 800 books uh, that he wanted to be investigated. And that's really when the ball started rolling you know a good a good general rule for um who should be reading a book is you you see how old the protagonist is in the book and that's usually who it's designed for that's the intended audience so Aiden the main character in Flamer is 14 and since the book was published on my website I've always said you know um recommended age 14 and up or with adult supervision. Um, because the other thing that we have to take into account also is that uh, maybe there are some readers who are younger than 14 who are ready for it because they have parents or guardians that have open conversations um, or they have had some of these life experiences uh, that maybe some of their peers haven't yet. But in terms of creating new work, I think everything that's happening is just proving the point why books like Flamer need to exist. So if anything, it's just uh, lighting a fire under me, um, no pun intended, to, yeah, write more gay stuff. <laughs> because we just need more. Um, and part of this pushback is uh, a response to 
underrepresented, undervoiced peoples finally having a platform to share their experience. Um, and we're not, we're not going back. We are not going back to not having a voice. An interesting adult uh, interaction I've had with several people um, is that they'll they'll message and say, "I'm I'm also Filipino. I'm also gay. I was also in Scouts. I was also an altar server. We're about the same age. How are you writing my life story?" Um, and what what's really unbelievable about that is thinking back to when I was 14 and thinking I'm all alone in the world. There's no one like me, but there were so many people who were exactly like me and we just didn't know that we existed. We didn't know that we were out there. And, um, wow, I can, I can't even imagine how, how different things could have been for me if I knew that those people were out there at the same time in their own little bubble. So a couple of things. Notice how quickly the conversation changed from people are trying to make you think that this book is in grade schools and it's not in grade schools, but this isn't about whether it's for that age group. Cause I mean, maybe somebody that young wants to read it and they should read it and we need a voice. So now we're going from it being in the issue being it being in grade schools when he specifically said even himself that it was for 14 and plus. So we shouldn't have any disagreement here. We should be able to say, hey, we agree. Shouldn't be in grade schools. That's fine. We don't need to make this an argument. But then it becomes, oh, but this book should exist, bro. The conversations around the ALA and the banned or challenged books list is not about whether or not the book should exist. It's about whether or not it is it should be in schools for young children. And he himself from his own mouth said that grade school was below the target age group that he had imagined for this book. So why is there an argument? Number three thing that I wanted to mention because it came at the tail end of that is he goes, I didn't realize that there were so many people just like me out there. That's not specific to his experience. That is an experience that many, many adults have that are not within this specific demographic. It's very hard when you're a teenager. You think that you're alone, especially when you're kind of the oddball, you don't fit in. I didn't fit in with anyone in school. I've constantly been trying to find my place in the world. I kind of just started creating my place in the world with this channel in my books and saying, well, this is it. You know, just love love me like I love Majma. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm cringe. Let's get back to the story though. Um, but so the whole thing was, no, this book is not in grade schools. It takes two seconds to see Parents Inflamed by Mature Graphic Novel in K through six library. The recent discovery of a graphic novel contains frank references to homosexuality, bullying, and self-harm at Costa Mesa Elementary School, as has Newport Mesa Unified School District officials reviewing how books make their way into the school libraries. Administrators at Wilson Elementary School were apprised by, of the situation last month when a group of parents found several copies of Flamer, a fictional work created by the author and illustrator Mike Corrado, on the shelves of K-6 libraries. So... We can verify that, let me tell you, it took one search for Flamers, graphic novel, elementary school, and this came up. So it's not hard to verify. So why do we got this guy saying, it's not happening, but then if it is happening, you know, it's fine. Mike, can we just agree that you said this isn't for this target audience, that it is fine to remove it from this because it is not for this audience. Can we say that? This is not a book ban. This is not taking away someone's voice. We just don't put this stuff in kids' books. That's all that it is. And you don't have the right, and you don't have the right to access of children with certain content. You increment mature content for the brain as it matures to help kids understand, but you don't need it in the K through sixth grade. Is it that hard? This is when these people start feeling malicious, start feeling insincere, because you can verify what they're saying and they lie as, this, as they also say, it's not happening. Anyway, with that said, let's get into the actual book throughout and the storyline of it. This is going to be a fairly short 
video compared to my other synopses of the books. And then we'll get into some of my final thoughts that don't work with putting it in with the story. I will put images of the comic book up at points so that you can see some of the pages I'm referring to as we go. That said, let's get into it. Aiden is at a summer camp after just graduating middle school. He's thinking about how he was given the choice of private high school or public school, and he wants to go to public school to get away from his middle school peers. I'm not sure this makes sense when his dad's then introduced as an abusive and over-the-top person about everything. Why would his dad give him the choice of where he wants to go if his dad was abusive and controlling? His parents are fighting. One time his dad almost hit his kid brother, but his mom stepped in and the dad hit the wall instead. When they argue until mom cries, mom then comes in to hug 14 year old Aiden afterwards for comfort in regards to the abuse situation and what seems like depression quote sometimes she asks me for advice and I don't know what to say especially when she talks about problems with dad which happens a lot and on rare occasions my father actually speaks to me it's usually to complain about mom mom needs friends this is inappropriate to be talking to your 14 year old and you know obviously an abusive household you're not gonna have perfect parents but this is not an appropriate situation for him to be in and also why why is dad confiding in the kid that he doesn't even like? Aiden just said that his dad doesn't like him. So why is his dad coming to him to freaking blow off steam when dad could be going over to his friends to call his wife a bitch? So like, what are we doing here? This is just reading like victimizing in all of the ways with no logic. And you'll continue to see this as we go forward. Aiden says people just want to come to him for help in general, including other kids at the camp. Then he's suddenly talking about some twins that he knows that are 10 years younger. Are they his siblings? Maybe. He's apparently the only one taking care of them because, quote, I hope the summer isn't sucking too much for them with me gone. I get really sick of everything being kept together by one person in a story, especially a child, and even all of the adults and the parents who hate that person also rely on that person. It's an obnoxious savior trope that I would not miss being gone. Usually it's also a trope used by liars, I'm just saying, Amber Heard syndrome. Now introducing Mail Call at the camp where he gets a letter from his friend Violet who reminds him that school starts in two weeks and he's not looking forward to that because he's expecting the football players to victimize him and at least one of them to call him a faggot every chance that they get. He talks about reinventing himself for high school and to be cool. Now they're canoeing out the frying pan island that looks like cock and balls island. They land and make jokes about pitching tents and whose ass belongs to who tonight. This also includes the camp leader making these comments. Aiden collects firewood and they sing around the fire. After turning in for the night, he talks to his buddy Elias, who had just broke up with his girlfriend, and Elias is like, bro, you're the only guy I know that I can talk to about girls. Thank you for being my friend. They then go back to the main island and are instructed to collect sticks to build a wall. Aiden asks about a drawbridge and is told yes, he can make a drawbridge if he finds enough wood. So then Aiden's imagining a castle with a drawbridge and talking to imaginary Elias, who is a knight, while Aiden is dressed as a princess. Mentioning Camelot leads to his camp buddies, quoting Monty Python, of course. Then it's time for the group to shower and Aiden is afraid of being seen naked and seeing other boys naked and people thinking that he wanted to look at them if people see him looking. Is it really necessary? to be drawing a shower scene flaunting the asses of 14 year olds it's just weird and unnecessary to be honest because nothing happens in the scene it's literally just you get a bunch of asses and a couple of guys making homo jokes in the shower then someone calls for the hairiest ass contest and spreads his cheeks to show off his hairy ass Aiden trips in the shower and drops the soap it lands right in front of his buddy Elias and Aiden gets an eyeful of Elias's crotch Aiden's getting a boner and quickly runs out of the shower now Aiden's lighting candles and incense for a mass at camp, basically, and stops before the statue of Jesus and his burning heart. He asks the priest there what it means, and the priest says, Christ's divine, infinite love and suffering for humanity. Aiden talks about being an altar boy for weddings and funerals and a neighbor girl who died, and so many people showed up to see her off. Then, he wondered who would show up at his funeral. Now, he's writing a letter to Violet. Then he goes to bed, and Elias asks what badge classes he's taking. They're both taking archery. Then he's sleeping and dreaming of riding into a castle where he finds Elias showering naked and Elias is like, bro, what are you looking at? And Aiden wakes up. Now it's archery time. Elias and Aiden are giggling about dick terminology that matches bow terminology until they're separated. Now he's in orienting class and someone asks, lol, you in the right place? Because this isn't orientaling class. And Aiden isn't paying attention to class because he's now just so pissed off. Aiden thinks about how he is constantly being reminded that he's different. Even at the end of the class day, the mates tell him to enjoy 
eating a dog. How is it that everyone everywhere in this book sucks all the time? Did he not just start this entire book off by talking about how much he loved camp more than school because it was cool and full of cool people? Could we just have like one thing, one place, one anything that doesn't victimize the main character of these books? Or is it all that is ever there even when they praise the situation in the first place? Don't worry though, there are flashbacks of random victimization coming out of nowhere, have nothing to do with the story, and then go into something completely different, disrupting the flow of the story for repetition. Because now Aiden is sitting at lunch reading an X-Men comic where he tells a classmate that Jean Grey is better than Wolverine because no one's just allowed to like the characters they like without other people mocking who they like as a character or telling them that their fave is weaker and then get mad at each other because that's what the fandom is all about, right? Aiden wishes that he had powers like Jean Grey so that he could bully his bullies and basically become a villain. Though, he, though if he was Wolverine, then he could just cut the fat off of his body with his claws. After basket weaving class, Aiden and his classmates go to the trading post and start talking about tits and ass and Melissa breaking Elias's heart, but he'll be fine because in high school he'll get plenty of tail, and then suddenly they're sounding like adults. The tone is not consistent in this book. The guy Aiden is with starts talking about girls that he likes, and Aiden's like, that's not love, that's just a boner. So then dude goes, lol, you're right, my dick gets so hard that my pants almost rip LMFAO. Yes, I am stating abbreviations as if that's all that they are. This conversation is followed by them running into a random bully that has nothing to do with anything, but he just has to make a comment about the guy's race and about being gay. Aiden runs away crying. How is he so in love with this camping scout team again when everybody is such an asshole? Aiden's now back at the campsite crying and another kid comes up to him and asks what's wrong. Aiden says someone called him a Chinese faggot and it bothers him. The guy is like, so call him a faggot back. And Aiden is like, no, I hate that word. So dude says, then deck him. And Aiden's like, I don't fight. Since Aiden's taking no suggestions, the dude is like, then I don't know what to tell you. Maybe stop crying at everything and people will stop picking on you. Aiden's still crying as he thinks, I know that I'm not gay. Gay boys like other boys. I hate boys and they are mean and scary. And they're always destroying something or saying something dumb or both. We learned at school how bad homosexuality is. It's a sin. Gay people do bad things and I'm not a bad person. I try to do good all the time so I couldn't be gay. Meanwhile, he's already fantasized about his best friend at least twice, cross-dressed, and got a boner while seeing his BFF naked. This is kind of heavy-handed in what it's trying to do and unnatural in a how it's presented. Aiden thinks about how faggot was historically used for bundle of woods and then how gays were burned in the Middle Ages and how much that must have hurt. Then his friend comes back up and says, don't listen to that asshole. Then we move on to the night campfire. Skip to later in the night when Aiden is looking for Elias and he's in a tent with other boys where they're jacking off into a bottle of an empty bottle of Mountain Dew where they then say anyone who doesn't come has to drink the bottle. I'm not joking. This feels like a fetish comic to be honest at this point. I'm like it's been a, at this point it's been a couple of weeks since I read this and reading over the synopsis I feel kind of insane. Let's be real. It's like why is this comic about a 14 year old so overly sexual? when it doesn't need to be. It's a summer camp. So Aiden talks about watching porn two years ago when he was 12 and jacking off and how it's a sin and now he's in a tent full of dudes jacking it. He leaves to the tent and goes back to bed where he dreams about Elias being Cyclops and he's Jean Grey turning into the Phoenix. But they'll get through this together. They're about to kiss when he wakes up. Back to doing archery, he's talking about it being invented by someone trying to defend himself against his own enemies. He talks about choosing the name Saint Sebastian for himself and going to his confirmation and how amazing it was to learn about the Catholic saints that basically turned them into Christian superheroes. He talks about going to his confirmation and expecting things to happen to him when he got confirmed, but once smeared with ash by the bishop, nothing happened and it was more or less a letdown. Back in orienting class, a kid makes the comment about sleeping with the scout leader's mom last night and the scout leader responds in the most inappropriate way. The kid keeps pushing his luck, the teacher mocks the kid, and then Aiden's laughing at the kid too and then he feels bad. The teacher compliments 
Aiden on his comments toward the bully. So apparently it's okay to bully the bully if you've got the power of the teacher behind you. So now he's thinking that he needs to write a letter to Violet about the bully and also his dreams because those are bothering him since they're all about Elias. The guys go out to play volleyball and he doesn't want to. Then he's thinking about how gay sports are, but also everyone talks about teamwork and if you suck at sports, then they don't want you. He's surprised when no one wants him on their team when he doesn't even try when he's playing sports. He also doesn't want to play volleyball because his fat will jiggle when he jumps, but he's fine watching Elias and lusting after his shirtless young body. He writes a letter to Violet asking if she'd still be his friend if he was weird, mails it, and then on to basket weaving class where he succeeds while his buddy David sucks at weaving a basket. Only one week left of camp and then it's time to go home so the boys are talking about starting high school. Then the boys go together to play Dungeons and Dragons where Aiden is forced into being a hobbit because they're teasing him and he's not allowed to be an elf since he's short and apparently doesn't have enough sense to just force his way into being an elf. Then they're singing around a campfire and Aiden starts going on about how he hates the sound of his own voice because it's so high pitched. Skip to some kids confronting Aiden after the fire pit to tell the other kids that they think he's gay and he's like well I'm not and the other kid is like well you act like it so maybe if you act normal people will stop picking on you so Aiden goes into a speech that says when he acts normal people will pick on him more and he can never be anything else he's all impassioned the guy says fine whatever do what you want to do and then walks off Aiden gets mad and is like the only person who isn't a dick to me is Elias he goes to bed and dreams about him and Elias being Frodo and Sam, and Elias throws him into the fires of Mordor. The next day is archery, and Elias gives him tips on how to hit his mark. Aiden finally hits the target. Then they leave class and are walking and are made fun of for being gay again because that's all that this book seems to do in every scene all the time, whenever they interact with any persons. Just so you know, that's the conflict. Well, that and making fun of Aiden for being Asian because... They're going to go hiking and orienteering, and uh, the bully kid makes another lol oriental reference. Aiden gets lost while hiking and then just sits down and starts crying. The scout leader comes over to comfort him and shows him how to orient his map. The scout leader has a talk with Aiden that he'll figure out what true north and himself are when the time is right. Aiden is like, Ted is so cool, I wish I was more like him, and then starts wearing his hair like Ted. This makes some of the other kids start calling him a faggot and attack him, saying, Cut it out! Which he means the ponytail. The guy pulls at Aiden's hair. Aiden punches him in the face. Bully says, Motherfucker. Aiden screams, You're a faggot! You're a fudge-packing, fairy, cock-sucking, queer, pansy faggot! Bully spits out a tooth. Bully is then gonna fuck Aiden up, and then a bear appears. Oh my gosh, the bear is gonna break up this drama. You go, bear. Let's be real. The bear is the real MVP here. Goes over to the food area and takes all the food. And then the kids are all just like, holy fuck. Yes, they all use that swearing. Elias comes up and starts yelling at the bully for bullying Aiden. Aiden walks away with another kid who has wet his pants. The scout leader finally shows up and is like, what happened? And the other adults and chaperone is like, I think a bear just came and broke up this fight. <laughs> what? Bear, bear being a better chaperone than all of the adults in this camp, apparently, because at least the bear was present. The scout leader calls Aiden and the bully over. He makes them both apologize to one another and then sends them off to class. At basket weaving, the buddy named David is like, lol, that was so awesome, the fight that you just had, and the bully isn't going to bully you ever again because, like, you kicked that guy's ass. Since it's Wednesday, they play camp-wide games, and Aiden's team wins. In the night, Elias and Aiden sneak out onto a canoe while everyone is sleeping and talk about how scared they are of high school. It acts like Elias is made fun of for having long hair as if this isn't the 90s where it was normal to have long hair and big male musicians had long hair for a long time. Also, apparently the jocks all hate Nirvana in 1995. Can I get a fact check on this please? Because I was only a single digit in 1995. Not to give my age away. And then Aiden is fawning over how Elias is the only cool football player because he's the only one that's not an asshole. They compliment each other on being cool and they head back to their tent. They take off their clothes and lay together listening to a mixtape that Aiden brought. And then Aiden goes in for the kiss. 
Elias then gets up and is like, bro, what the frick was that? Maybe we should just go to bed now. It's been a long day. And Aiden is feeling so bad now, as he should for violating his best friend's trust. Thank you very much. Then he's dreaming about being chased down and burned at the stake. Because you know what you do with wood? You burn it. This completely ignores how Aiden had allowed himself to be Elias' springboard for talking to Melissa, his girlfriend, and making up with her earlier in the book. Aiden just completely took advantage of Elias' vulnerability and trust, and he is feeling bad for himself, not what he did to Elias. When Aiden wakes up, Elias is gone, and the friendship bracelet that Aiden made him is on the floor. Now Aiden's legitimately emo, and his camp counselor is like, what's wrong with him? Like, Aiden even put on a black hoodie, just so you know that he is in his emo arc. Aiden won't talk to anybody, and just walks off after being told to think of the good things in life. You know, that's... That's how you cure depression. Aiden is going through the day, trying not to cry, mostly failing. He gets to orienteering class, and his favorite teacher has been dismissed. At lunch, Aiden hears some adults talking about how the teacher was let go, and they're saying that it's because none of the counselors are supposed to be talking about sexual things around the kids, and some of the teachers go, Psh, that's just hypocrisy. You're telling me that you haven't made a dirty joke around the kids? What's wrong with you? You're a liar. We've all made dirty jokes around the kids, haven't we? I would report that guy if I was you. Like, that's sketchy. How is it, I just, how is it so hard to not make dirty jokes and sexual talk around kids for like two to three weeks while you're at camp? Because this guy defending being dirty around children because it's straight also needs to be reported. It's not okay. It doesn't matter the sexuality of your nasty comments. You don't need to be making them around children. How about this, you guys? Just don't talk about sex for a couple of weeks while you're around someone else's kids or go get a different freaking job. It's not that hard. I could not tell you. Sex comes up so often in these books, and it never comes up in my real life. Only when I'm ever talking about these books does sex come up in conversation. And even talking about these books, I kind of pull back on because uh, just talking about them has offended some of the people that I know. And it's especially hard to get on board with this defense of this teacher woman. When we saw him making comments about someone else's mom banging someone else's mom and then tells him he didn't say or do anything around the kids. Bro, we saw it. Was that comment more benign than it could have been? Yes, but you still don't talk like that to a kid. This is trying to set up a false narrative that the book already disproves because that teacher, we saw him saying things that were inappropriate around kids. Aiden leaves the mess hall and sees Elias talking on the phone to his girlfriend Melissa on the phone outside. So Aiden wanders off sad, dropping the friendship bracelet that he had been carrying. Aiden goes to basket weaving class where he acts like an asshole to his friend David and tells him to bugger off so David does. At mail call, he doesn't have a letter from Violet like he's expecting. He sees David and Elias talking to one another and assumes that they're talking about him. The camp leader asks Aiden what's wrong and Aiden says nothing is wrong. The camp leader, not believing this, says, why don't you help me build a campfire? You know, take your mind off things. And Aiden says he's not feeling good and asks to go to bed early. He calls home to talk to his mom, but his parents are fighting, so he tells his sister that he loves her and te he tells her to tell their mom that he loves her too. Then he's like, goodbye. Apparently, you don the black hoodie, you're gonna go emo. Guys, so just be prepared when you see me put on black. This is why I've got the duality here for the emo and the non-emo. Aiden then goes back to his tent and Elias's bed is all cleaned up. He lays in bed wallowing in self-pity about how he'll never be enough when he was the one who came onto Elias inappropriately. He then dreams about a funeral of him where he is in a canoe being pushed off into the water by a bunch of troops and then it is set on fire with flaming arrows. He wakes up to his empty room, makes his bed, writes a note, and wanders off into the forest. Apparently, scout leaders watching the camp are not a thing in this universe, and um, the bear is now busy. He wanders through the woods to a random chapel without anyone seeing him at all, withdraws a pocket knife and cuts his wrists in front of the cross. He hits a dream world where everything is on fire and this flaming archer person approaches him. Aiden is like, is this hell? And the fire archer is like, no, everything is on fire because it is the fire of life within you. This is your soul. The fire archer shoots a fire arrow into Aiden and it is like, ah, it stings. And the archer is like, yes, such is life. It shall burn, but it will heal.
Aiden doesn't acknowledge how he betrayed Elias and starts saying, I am so alone! Elias thinks I'm disgusting! I have no one! And the archer is like, what about your friends? And Aiden's out here going, but are they really my friends or do they think I'm disgusting too? How can I trust them? What if they hate me when they find out that I'm possibly, probably a homosexual? I see he's judging people before giving anyone a chance while not wanting people to do the same thing to him. Will Aiden reflect on this? The answer is no. No, he won't. He's also now throwing a fit about Violet because he didn't get a letter for a single day. And how this is her betraying him too. Gosh darn it. The world is supposed to serve Aiden and only Aiden's needs all the time or else screw you. Honestly, Aiden deserves no friends when he acts like this. He respects no one. The flaming archer is like, okay, but even if all of this is true and none of your friends like you and you'll be beat up and alone in high school, what about your family? Your mother and your twin siblings love you. Do you want them to cry for the rest of their lives? And Aiden's like, but what about my dad? You know, the one that I said almost beat up my brother before and who abuses us all? And the fire creature is like, yes. Even your dad loves you. You just don't see it right now. So is the dad, like, actually beating them, or is he just kind of stern? Because I can't tell when they're like, Yes, your abusive father does love you. All is forgiven. Just give dad time, and you will understand daddy's love. This told me that either Aiden is lying about how abusive his dad is, or this book is legitimizing abusive behavior as loving. For me, it read like the author is writing about a situation that he's maybe seen in television and movies, but he doesn't really understand what an abusive relationship household actually looks like. But that's just my, my guess based on how this is written. It's a lot of, here is the shallowest version of what this looks like without understanding what you're doing. The fire archer is then like, even if everyone forsakes you, you are enough. And then he merges with the fire creature to come as a phoenix slash deity without doing anything or believing anything or even trying to do anything or coming to terms with him being a sucky person. He just becomes a fire person. I don't know why he deserves this. He doesn't deserve this. He made no changes of any kind. So then Aiden wakes up. And it turns out that he didn't actually cut himself, but passed out in fear of what he was about to do and went on a tr acid trip, a fear trip, as it were. He goes outside and people are approaching the chapel. One of them is Elias asking what Aiden's doing here. Aiden is like, uh, uh, I got lost. Apparently everyone went looking for him as soon as they noticed that he was missing. Elias returns the friendship bracelet that Aiden dropped yesterday and apologizes for freaking out when Aiden kissed him. You took me by surprise, is what he says. Aiden apologizes for surprising Elias, not for taking advantage of him, and learns that they can still be friends so you're telling me Aiden had tried to change his relationship with Elias by surprise and force and Elias had a girlfriend then Aiden's immediate response to his kiss not being accepted was to commit suicide like a day later because it's only been one to two days tops see uh the kiss happened Wednesday night then he lived through Thursday and then tried to kill himself Friday morning this is insanely manipulative disrespectful to all of his friends Aiden was the one who was judgmental of Elias and violated him, and Elias is the one asking to be friends again. This is bad, and the author should feel bad for having done this. And now that they have made up, classes are going fine. Aiden gets a letter in the mail. Oh, wow, it looks like Aiden proclaimed his friend betrayed him because her letter didn't get to him soon enough when it was literally just snail mail taking another day. Nice, Aiden. I bet you won't apologize for thinking poorly of literally all of your friends. Turns out that the letter was late because, and it wasn't even the fault of the mail for, for why it was late. It was actually late because it was hung up with the food and not that it didn't come in. So here Aiden is accusing Violet of being a bad friend, but her letter says nothing is wrong with him and that she will always be his friend, which is a lie. And here she is saying that she will always be his friend and that nothing is wrong with him. That is a lie. He has a victimhood complex to the point where he was rejected for a kiss which made him spiral and lash out at all of his friends, accuse them all of betraying him, and go on to kill himself. There is something wrong with him. So normal campfire continues. 
normal campfire continues. Everyone embraces him and how he is. He monologues about how campfires can still be going, and there is a regulation to make sure that you put out the fires totally. Then, my life feels like a mess. There are people I still don't know how to deal with. Bro, you're 14. You're not going to know how to deal with every single person forever. I still don't know how to deal with people. Look at my YouTube comments. <laughs> He throws the goodbye letter into the fire. Oh, yeah, because they all went looking for him when he actually also wrote a suicide letter and left it on his bed. Apparently, nobody found that suicide letter and then was like, holy shit, they were all confused. You'd think the first thing that they would notice when they went into Aiden's room would be the note on the bed and then they would read it and it would be suicide and then they would confront him for that. But apparently, we're not going to talk about how this kid tried to kill himself. So his goodbye letter is now in the fire and he's like, I'm not done burning yet, even if I don't know how to deal with life. Again, bro. You're 14. That's the end of the book. So a couple of things like my odd notes that don't fit into the rest of that, but are just kind of criticism with my pop-up, whatever. This book started out with an exposition dump about abuse at home and Catholic school, which I didn't care about. Starting your book with a bunch of info dumping, especially angst dumping, is a weak attempt to try to build sympathy very, very quickly by putting your character in a bad situation. But if you just dump on me a bunch of bad things, I'm just not going to care. Show me the story and why I should be invested. This kid having a sad life is not enough to do that. His life isn't even sad. Apparently his dad beating him is just a way that his dad shows love. So if he, his dad even beats him, we don't even know. It just says abusive. His dad doesn't beat him. He said almost beat up the wall. His dad has anger issues, beat the wall, and has never touched anybody apparently. So there is that. This book also feels like it is for younger children based on the narrative style in which it is written. There is nothing to capture older kids' attention, yet the store says this is for grades 10 through 12. Okay, so we get to add that to the conversation earlier with the video where Mike, the author, said that this was for kids 14 and plus. The Amazon store and the booksellers say that this is for grades 10 through 12, so that's 16 to 18 year olds. It is written not in a way that would be appealing to kids that old. And the MC just graduated high school. So who is the target audience here? And you can't even trust the author because the author is like, well, it's not for grade schoolers, but also if grade schoolers get their hands on it, good. When I was on the Goodreads page looking at reviews from adults, I saw them saying, I feel seen. So then this book is for you, not the kids. Even the author said this when he said, there were people coming up to me saying, hey, I was this kid and I felt like this and you made me feel like I was seen. Okay, so if that's also something, a vibe that I got from this, if this book means a lot to other people who went through this situation and are now adults, then the audience for this book is adults who want to commiserate the situation with other adults, not for kids. Another quote that I saw from one of the reviews was, I feel uncomfortably seen. Is this what it feels like for a straight people every time they read a book or watch a movie completely recognized and utterly understood? It's surreal to realize as an adult how many of my teenage experiences were not unique because I never saw them represented anywhere no this is not what i feel like whenever i see a straight person on the screen or in a book that is an insane amount of narcissism i have never felt anything you've just described when reading this being the top priority and how you consume stories is bizarre to me and a projection of a privilege that's not really there it's just a an attempt at a justification of doing this because oh i feel seen is this how everybody else feels no! And getting back to the book, the jumping is pacey. The book's trying too hard to drop exposition rather than building the story or the characters anywhere. There's so much victimization too where it doesn't actually build the story. It's just the victimhood. So I'm going to need some of the male viewers from the chat who especially have experience with camp there were non-stop gay jokes in this book non-stop from these kids that were specifically not gay and then you had the whole mountain dew bottle full of cum that somebody was gonna have to drink um was that normal for your camp experience also the only kinds of jokes that these 14 year olds and their camp leader apparently make are sex jokes with each other to males watching this review has this been your experience when you were a teenager, when you were especially a middle schooler? I also got a comment. What is with these memoirs, memoirs or short stories or whatever, books with images that are for kids that have the ugliest art possible? It's like they want to go, hey, look at me. I put zero effort into this piece of shit because I know that I don't have to. That's what it all reads. 
we've also got another story where literally nothing happens. So if we go from the beginning to the end, what actually happens with the story? Mike goes to summer camp. He kisses his best friend. He never actually talks to his best friend about what happened. He just goes off to try to kill himself after moping for a day. And then his friend finds him and his friend apologizes for being surprised. And Aiden becomes a phoenix after killing himself. He doesn't even find power in himself or recognize his own faults or do anything. He's just like told by this external thing that you are powerful. And then he's like, I'm alive again. So Aiden does nothing but mope and be a bitch for the majority of the book. He doesn't deal with any of his bullies. He doesn't come into himself. He doesn't do anything. But he's still rewarded at the end and then acts like he's got some powerful thing when he did nothing. I didn't understand the juxtaposition of I'll take public school over private school because it'll be better. And then every time he brings up public school, it's like, God, it's going to be hell. Like, you're not even trying to set up hope for him beyond the momentary beginning where you directly shit on Catholic schools. But then everything else sucks and he's expecting to be beat up and called names by the high school kids. And so, like... Why even mention it? It also shows that this author did not care anything about Catholics or Christians. He used both terms interchangeably. Uh, they have very different practices. But this shows how little respect the author has for Catholics, Christians, and the elements that he used for this story. Don't ever talk to me about representation again. Thank you very much. The amount of times this book says fuck is enough for it to not be in schools, period. Considering you say fuck once in a movie and, well, you say, you say fuck twice in a movie and it gets an R rating. You say it once in a non-sexual manner and apparently you can still be PG-13. So kids can't buy a movie ticket for a movie that is just like this, but they can get this in a kindergarten library. The comparison to Jean Grey was shallow and insulting, not used to build a story at all, and did not put the character through a character arc that could even pretend to be Jean Grey's from the comic. The references to his abusive family were also insulting and shallow, especially when you say my abusive father is actually just loving me. Why was religious imagery used throughout all of this? It was not relevant for this dude other than him wanting to become a saint, which also shows narcissism. This book was so self-aggrandizing, the dude tried to kiss a guy who trusted him, got turned down, and in a matter of 24 hours decided that he wanted to kill himself but he had all of this fire in his soul to begin with get out of here this character is not a hero he is an asshole but he is being raised as a hero finally the only audience for this book to me the last thing is the only audience i see for this book is adults who wants to feel good about themselves by pretending they are supporting some sort of justice cause or they see this as self-insert fan fiction of their life where it's how they wish their summer camps had gone back in middle school so that they can kind of just themselves that's what i see going on here anyway that was flamer by mike carrado can i just say that we need a better contemporary books for kids because this is ridiculous how bad they are that's pretty much the biggest thing that i'm taking away from all of this also yeah 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 the next review will be of um the lawn boy and that is the book that convinced me that the ala's uh challenged book list is a scam to sell books get into that with my next book review with that said let me know your thoughts down in the comments below what did you think of flamer have you read it will you read it what do you think of the author saying that this is not in grade schools but it is in grade schools is this book okay to be in k through sixth grade for you or is that like no but it's fine for middle schools what do you think of all of the swearing in this book like for me that's not something that needs to be in school if a parent's going to give that to their kids it's whatever obviously but with schools fucking faggot being on like every single other page though what's more offensive to me is the fact that there is no narrative structure to this book at all there's no story to follow and um aiden is made out to be a hero even though he makes a move on a guy who is emotionally vulnerable gets turned down and then victimizes himself to the point of wanting to kill himself 24 hours later that is offensive and it's never actually addressed and I'm sick of people using I'm going to kill myself as a way to manipulate others. Um, but those are my thoughts. Let me know yours down in the comments below. With that said, thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend and don't die. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it. 
But as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300, and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. I'm not talking to the badges, I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk, Way. Why? Did you do that? To the left, plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, you chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry, flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right?